Uh, I'm Irv Yalom, and I'd like to introduce to you the, the tape of an inpatient group that we're about to see. Uh, there are a few things I want to tell you about this tape. First of all, I'd like to mention that this is a simulation of a group. Um, however, uh, it's a, uh, although it's a simulated group, I believe it's representative of a real group. It's a real group that I've constructed out of my, say, 30 years of group therapy experience. The patients in this group are therefore not real patients, but they're individuals whom we've enlisted to play the role of patients. Um, I, th I think I need to say some things about the setting of this group. One of the differences between an outpatient group and an inpatient group is that unlike the outpatient group, the inpatient group is never a freestanding group. You always need to consider it in its context, in the context of the inpatient ward in which it's ensconced. Um, inpatient wards uh, vary uh, tremendously, and there are many different types of uh, therapy groups uh, on the inpatient wards that I've visited around the country. In fact, I could uh, compose a long list of groups from uh, medication education groups, from admission groups, from psychoanalytic groups, from therapeutic community groups, from dance therapy groups, uh, and, and so forth. And I think all these groups have something to offer patients. At the same time, however, I think they may add some confusion to the treatment program of patients unless they're also coupled with a, uh, a, a regular, frequently meeting, talking group that patients can depend on to, to meet uh, as frequently as possible. I, I think a talking group should be meeting on inpatient ward uh, daily, if possible. And the group that you're about to see is a, is a model of such a regularly uh, meeting group. The ward on which this group takes place is a 20-bed ward, an acute psychiatric ward in a community um, uh, medical center. Uh, it's very typical of today's contemporary wards. A couple of characteristics of the ward which have a tremendous influence on the conduct of the group are that it's a, uh, a, it's a ward in which patients stay an average of seven to ten days. Again, very common in contemporary hospital uh, practice. And furthermore, it's a ward in which there's a great a range of pathology, great heterogeneity of, of the population. Now, in, in viewing this group, I want to remind the students that I don't mean this particular group or this group meeting to be a blueprint for the type of group that you will lead uh, on your ward. I mean it to be a, an example of a type of, of clinical therapy group from which you might extrapolate to create a type of group that will fit your particular clinical setting. Okay, well let, let's turn to this specific group that you're going to see. This is a group of seven patients. This, is, this group meets daily. It meets for an hour and 15 minutes. On this ward of 20 beds, it's the high-level group of that ward. In other words, there's also a group meeting at the same time of lower-level patients, patients who don't have the type of attention span or may be more fragmented than these patients. The prerequisite for the members of this group to attend this group are simply they have an attention span that will allow them to sit still, to attend to the procedure for, for an hour and 15 minutes, that they can talk, that they have enough insight to realize that something is wrong about themselves that they'd like to be able to alter. Uh, the patients may be psychotic in this group, they may be hallucinating, but they, they need to be able to focus on the, on the task in such a way that it won't be disruptive to others. The range of pathology, as you will see, is, is very broad in this group. Uh, we have patients uh, who represent a wide range of, of uh, difficulties. Uh, there are seven patients in this group. I'm, I'm not going to give you a detailed introduction to each one because you're going to be uh, meeting them as the, as the group unfolds. But let me just uh, give you just a capsule summary of the reason that they're in the hospital. Uh, in this group, we have Rose, an elderly woman who has been chronically depressed and is in the hospital for reassessment of her medication. We have Mabel, who's also deeply depressed, who's an exceedingly hypochondriacal yeah, woman just, who has a no, chronic uh, conversion paralysis. Sonia, a young woman in the, uh, on the unit with a, a very severe eating disorder, 
uh, ranging from bulimia uh, to purging uh, to a severe anorexia, which on many occasions has been uh, life-threatening in its uh, severity. And we have Tom, uh, a young man who's just recovering from a severe psychotic manic episode. Uh, he's responding uh, to medications, and this is the first day where we thought it was possible that Tom might be able to attend uh, a group and not be disruptive. George, who's a uh, surgeon who suffered a uh, severe cardiovascular accident, severe stroke, uh, and he has made a, uh, a quite a severe suicide effort. We have Marge who's a borderline patient who's been uh, self-destructive for uh, a number of years and has made many, many uh, attempts, often gestures, uh, but many attempts at, uh, at suicide. We have Meryl, a uh, homeless, uh, disorganized young woman who's abused a wide variety of drugs uh, since mid-adolescence. So, I think uh, with that introduction, uh, we, we might then begin to turn to the tape. This is the uh, first meeting for me after I've been away on vacation for a while, so I've, I don't know many of the patients in that time. And we're going to be showing you the entire hour and 15 minutes of this group. Is this all right? Yeah. You're okay, Jerry? Yeah. Um, I've known, I know a couple of you. Sonia and Marge from, from another, another admission, but I've been on vacation, so I don't know the rest of you. I'm, I'm Irv Yalom, and I want to say some things about this, this group. I'll probably be saying the same things every time we start the group, so if you don't get it all today, you'll, you'll hear it again tomorrow. Uh, this is the agenda group. We meet every day from 1 to 2.15. Uh, usually I have a co-therapist, Phyllis, who's, who has a day off today, but the group meets five times a week. Uh, I'm here uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but the group meets on Friday. Phyllis will be leading the group uh, then alone on Friday. Um, I want to just say some things about the uh, uh, attendance. You know, this is a voluntary group, uh, but our time is very valuable here, and it's best if we have as few sort of interruptions as possible. So if any of you can't get here on time, or you have to leave early, it's best not to come that day, come, come the next day, so we can sort of have uninterrupted time. i say something about the purpose of this group. The purpose of this group is to help all of you learn as much as you can about the way you relate to one another. Okay, I know you're feeling that that's not the reason that you come into the hospital, and we know that. But the reason that we do that is that everybody here, that includes myself too, can stand to learn more about our relationships. Learn more about what we get out of our relationships with others and how to get more out of our relationships with others. Why they work, why they don't work. And the reason that we focus on that in this group is that that's what groups can do best of all. Okay? Now, the way this group works is that we will start off first with a round of agendas, in which I mean that I'm asking each of you to say something about what you'd like to work on in this group today, something that's got to do with relationships with other people, something about your relationships with other people that you'd like to change or improve or learn more about. Okay? You, you listening, Meryl? You? Okay. Um, after that, after we go around the group and get an agenda from each person, then we're going to spend some time trying to work on each of these agendas. And then about, oh, about 2 o'clock, about an hour from now, we're going to then uh, ask the observers who are in the next room, you know, watching through the closed circuit TV camera up there, uh, to come into the room. The observers are going to be medical students. It varies from day to day, but they'll either be medical students, sometimes the psych residents, uh, nursing students or some of the staff nurses, and there's generally somewhere between one and four. Anybody who watches the group has got to come into the room at the end, and for the last few minutes, I and the other observers are just going to discuss this group, and you all can just listen into our discussion, and then if you've got some comments on that, then you contribute to that in the last five minutes. So that's the schedule for the meeting, for, for each of our meetings, okay? 
Okay, so let's uh, let's start off then with with agendas. Wait, wait. Uh, I don't understand what I don't understand what an agenda is. Okay, well by agenda I mean I want you each to say, pick out an area, something you can work on in the group today that's got to do with your relationships with people, something you want to change, something you want to improve or learn more about relationships with people. Don't 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 sweat it, Tom, because really that's my job and Phyllis's job to really help you shape an agenda. This uh, preparation that I've given to patients or orientation, I think is fairly self-explanatory, but there are a few other points I want to make about that. Uh, first of all, I think that, the, that some form of preparation is needed, is necessary, useful in every type of group therapy situation. Um, in an outpatient group, I'll spend time in my initial screening session with patients, perhaps 20, 30 minutes, orienting them to, to group therapy. Uh, in an inpatient group, uh, because the consistency, the constitution of the, of the group changes every single meeting, uh, I, I offer an orientation to the group every single session, even though it's just two or three minutes. There's a lot of, of research evidence attesting to the, uh, to the usefulness of, of preparation. I think it's especially important in the, in the inpatient setting, and, and it serves many functions. First of all, it simply orients patients about time, place uh, uh, of the group, but it also uh, provides them with some structure. Um, and I think that's one of the major modifications one needs to make in, in group therapy technique in the inpatient setting. Uh, you've got a group of uh, very disorganized individuals who I think crave and need some type of structure that can be imposed by the therapist. So uh, I use the orientation to provide some structure, to let them know about how this meeting is going to be structured. That's perhaps the most uh, efficient type of structure you can provide to patients, uh, so that, each of, that this whole meeting is going to be broken down to, uh, to several different segments and let them know what those are so they can anticipate these. I think the, uh, the preparation also is a, is a method of reducing anxiety. Uh, our patients are anxious enough with whatever their primary issues are, and what we don't want to do is to uh, increase anxiety, give them a sort of uh, secondary anxiety by throwing them into a rather uh, ambiguous, enigmatic type of situation where they don't know what to do and they don't know what's expected of them. So I like to be uh, crystal clear with patients about what's coming up and what they can do uh, to help themselves in this, in this situation. Now the last thing that I said uh, in the preparation was to introduce to them the, the next stage of the group that you're going to be seeing in just a couple minutes, and that's the agenda stage. Uh, I, I've, I, I've introduced this into the way that I like to lead groups because I think it provides a great deal of structure, lets patients take some responsibility for the type of work that they're going to um, perform and commit themselves to in the group. Uh, you notice that I've tried to reduce some of the pressure of forming the agenda with patients as I tell them, well, it's my job to be helpful and, and not to sweat it. At the same time, I like patients to do some work on the agenda. Sometimes I see patients at other times of the day thinking about their agenda for the next meeting or talking with one another, even using their individual therapy to formulate an agenda. And I, I think that's, that's all for the good. So uh, with this introduction, then, let's go ahead and, and take a look at the, the next phase of the group, uh, how each uh, member of the group offers some type of agenda for the work to be done during this meeting. Well, let's see who will start first. Rose can start. Well, is that all right, Rose? Well, I, I, I may not belong here. I, I really don't see much point in going on. I just don't think there's much point in living much anymore. Rose, what do you think that we could do to be helpful to you in this group? Say that, what kind of agenda could you come up with, you think, for us today? I, I don't know. I guess my depression, I guess. I don't know. Rose, there's no question but that depression is the 
is the issue that you want to work on. And that, but that's what you want to work on in all your therapy. All the time you're in the hospital, all the outpatient work, and, and you know, for the whole time that you're on medication and, and undergoing psychotherapy. So that's the goal of all your therapy, but it's too big for us to really tackle you know, in any effective way in the group. Can you select some smaller piece that we can help you with right here in this group today? Something to do with, with, uh, with your relationships. Do you have any relationships with people? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I don't have any relationships with people. I live alone ever since my husband, Stuart, died. and I've been depressed ever since. Sound lonely. About the only time I have anybody that talks to me is when I go to the grocery store, or when the social worker comes around. Yeah. yeah, this sounds like there might be a really important kind of agenda, some sort of important work that you could do in this group today, Rose. I'd like to suggest that we try to focus on loneliness for you, on your isolation. And, and I'd like to suggest that maybe we could do some focusing on your loneliness right here, right here in this ward, right here in this group, and perhaps you could say some things later on when we come back to it, of how you kind of contribute to your being lonely here, here in this ward, here in this group. I don't know any of these people. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we could take a look later on about what you've done about getting to know them and what's gone right, what's gone wrong in that. Would you be willing to do that later? I guess so. Okay, it's a good agenda for you, Rose. Let's, let's come back to it. That's great. Okay, should we just go around in a circle? Mabel, what would you like to work on here today? Well, uh, I think the only reason I'm here is because of my hand. Um, about five years ago, you know, after my husband died, um, I had this seizure and I woke up. And when I woke up from that, my hand was like this. And so they did all these tests on me and they, they can't find any reason why my hand would be like that. But my hand is like this, see, and uh, that's all there is. I mean, that's all that there is that I need to get handled. That's all that there is that I need to get handled. I, I understand about how, uh, how disturbing and how painful the, the, the problem with your hand is. But, you know, I still have a sense that's not an issue that we can help you with here in this group. I think we need to work on on you, not your hand. We need the hand sort of gets in the way of, of relating to you. But there's got to be something that can be done about it. I mean, I can't just go around for the rest of my life with my hand like this. I used to be able to do a lot of things. You know, you know what it's like to try to live with something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I used to be able to knit, and I could cook, and I could do all these things, and now I can't even dress myself with my hand like this. But I think if we're going to help you in this group, I think what we need to do is to try and help you talk some and learn some more about the way you relate to other people. Will you talk about your relationships with other people and see what we could find out there? Well, relationships, you mean like with my children? Well, with whoever is important to you. you know. My children are wonderful. I, I have three children. I have two boys and a girl. And they're, they're very successful. They're very successful. Of course, I mean, they come and spend some time with me. But there's something they can do about my hand, is there? There's something they can do about But why would they want to spend time with me? <laughs> you know, they're probably very busy. Uh, you know, they're, they're busy with their jobs. They're raising their families. It isn't because they don't love you. They're, they're just busy. Yeah, that's right. They're very busy. They're very busy. They're very busy, and they just don't, uh, you know, I can see why they don't want to come over, because I am just a burden. I'm just a burden. Huh? What else? Why would they want to spend time with me? I just like that. I don't know. One of my daughters said to me, she said to me that I was just a stuck record, that all I did was talk about my hand all the time. <laughs> I think that was very mean of her to say that to you. I think that was kind of cruel. Well, no, she's a very nice girl. She is a very nice girl. It's just, you know, I do. You know, sometimes I, I feel like your hand may be a way of your almost saying, you know, 
uh, pay attention to me. I want some attention and no one pays any attention to me. And, you know, that's only human. All of us want to get some attention. So sometimes I think you talk about your hand, I almost feel like translating that into something like pay attention to me. But, but Rose, let me pick up on what you were just. Uh, let me pick up on what you what you were just what you were just saying. Mabel. I'm Mabel. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll get the name straight in a minute. Okay. But Mabel, talking about the being a broken record, I wonder if that's not something you could take a look at here today. Would you be willing to sort of listen to some feedback from others, see whether there's other people who see you in that way, or what you're talking about your hand does to them? Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to hear anything that they have to say. What are you thinking? I was thinking maybe I feel like I have a headache. Um, I was thinking maybe I do not pay enough attention to other people. Huh? Maybe I do focus on that too much. Maybe, maybe you do what? Maybe I do focus on my hand too much. Well, see, I think it's got a lot to do with your feeling perhaps you don't have anything else to offer people. Did well, you get I do I. I mean, what can, I used to be able to knit. I really could knit really well. I knit beautiful things for all the children and my grandchildren. And you know now, people don't even care about handmade things. They just want things made by machines anyway. Maybe let me suggest an agenda for you that I think might be helpful. I want you to see if you could try something. I want to uh, focus on this whole feeling you've got nothing to offer anyone else. And I wonder if you could somehow help me in the meeting today, call on other people and make sure the other people in the group have a chance to talk, talk about filling some of their agendas, getting some help. I'll give you some cues, but would you be willing to sort of call on people today as we go along? All right. Okay. Yeah, as okay. long as I know you'll help me. Okay, great. Sonia, what could we do that would be helpful for you? Go on without me. I, What's happening? I was really bummed out today. I can't do it. Can't do what? Sonia, listen, the important thing is that you did come to the meeting today. I hear, I hear you say that there's a, a part of you that feels like dying. You know, but there's also a part of you that came into this group today. And there's a part of you that wants to live. I want to talk to that part of you. So let, let me just keep on talking to that part, the part of you that chose to come in here. I want to know what that part of you wants to do here today. I came. I don't know why I came to the group today, and I shouldn't have been. It was a mistake, and I'm. So, Sonia, I've, I've seen you work in groups before. I've seen you work in groups the last time you were in the hospital. Now, I've been aware that there are times you really work real well in the groups. You know, I think there have been times that you've come out of that group feeling better than when you came in. Is that right? Could you try, Sonia, to think back on one of those meetings? Can you remember, you know, what happened in that group? What, what, did, what did we do? What did I do? What did you do that ended up making you feel a little bit better? You know, sometimes it's real important to find out what makes people feel, feel well, feel better, as well as what makes them feel worse. So, so what happened in those meetings? Well... Somebody helped me a little bit. Somebody helped you a little bit? Yeah. How, how, did, how did they help you? Well, they told me it wasn't always going to feel like this. Mm -hmm. I don't want to feel like this. So what happened there was that somebody gave you some support, somebody told you that you wouldn't always feel like this, or somebody kind of gave you some hope? Yeah. Okay. So that would be one thing you might be able to get out of this group then, huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let me ask you this, Sonia. W would you please take a look around the group here? 
Tr try to, Sonia. Would you look at the people in this group? Who would you like to get some support from in the group here? Of, of the various people here, would you choose someone that you'd like I to get some? I don't want any help from anyone. Yeah, but if you were going to get some support from someone, Sonia, look around the group. Who would you most like to get it from? Take a chance, because I think this is the only way we can really give you something. Marge. Okay. So you'd like to get something from Marge, some form of support from Marge today. Okay, that's great. I think that's a good agenda. And we're glad you're able to come out to say that, Sonia. Okay. Terrific. Let's let's move on. Tom, what, what could we do here in the group that would be useful for you? What is there about the way you relate to people that you'd like to learn well, more about? You could... My agenda could be, why does the doctor say that I'm um, passive-aggressive? You want to say some more about that? Well, why does, why does he say that? What's pa what is passive-aggressive? Yeah. What, is, what is that and why does him... Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it's hard for us to work on that exactly, Tom, because your doctor's not here in the group. I mean, you know, maybe if you could talk about what your understanding is of what he means, something like that. It's... Maybe passive-aggressive is that you get mad sometimes and sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. Or well, you get mad and you don't mean it. Well, look... I wonder if I could ask you, kind of put it in your, in your own words, Tom, what would you, not your doctor, but what would you like to learn about yourself? You know, given this opportunity, given a lot of people here who might be able to, to give you some feedback and help you, what would you like to change about the way you relate to others? I'd like to know why my dad calls me a kid. Mm -hmm. Why your dad calls you a kid. Yeah. Maybe we can get some help from others. Could, could some of you others... Are you with us, Meryl? Meryl, can you can you stay stay on track here? I, I wonder if some of you others could give give me a help with as I'm working here with Tom. Um, let me ask you: Would you, for a moment, imagine that you were Tom? If you were Tom, what kind of agenda might you come up with for for him today? I think maybe I think maybe. If if I was, you know, I'd want to find out why I fight so much with the staff. Okay, so you'd want to know, you'd be a general... Well, of course, the staff's not really here, so help me. But you want to know why, why, he, why I fight so much, if you uh, were here. Okay. He fights uh, a lot. Uh, maybe he would uh, be better off in a, in, a, in a group that was younger than this. He's the youngest one in our group. Maybe he'd be able to interact better with a, a different group, younger group. Okay, okay. Are there other suggestions about agendas for Tom? Say he were here in this group, you were he. What would you suggest? Maybe Tom could work on why he acts like a kid here in the group. Okay, so, okay, that's, that sounds real workable, Sonia. So you're saying, if, if, I'll pretend I'm Tom, I'd like to find out then a why, if I act like a kid here in this group? That's great. That's a great agenda. Any others? Maybe he could... Maybe he could ask if he's acting passive-aggressive right now. Right now. Okay. Good. That's, that's enough. Right, those are good possibilities. Would you be willing to, to take one of those as an agenda? Let's just say, uh, maybe act like a kid. Would you be willing to say, do I act like a kid here in this group? I want to get some feedback from others. How would you feel about All that? All right. All right. Okay. Great. That's a good agenda. Good way for you to get some feedback, get some looks at others, how others see your behavior. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Okay. George, what could we do that would be helpful for you? What kind of agenda could you come up with? I guess this is my agenda. Walking again. <clears throat> I'm so ashamed. Please excuse me. I, uh, I guess I don't know how to work in groups. I'm a surgeon. I look at facts. I, I work with facts to help other people. Now, I, I'm not a surgeon anymore. 
I'll never practice again. The stroke has ruined me. I, I uh, even have to learn how to walk again. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't work. I used to work 80 hours a week. What and is your family? Well, they were all right. Uh, I provided for them well. My wife took good care of them. Hey, the kids worked out fine. But in all my life, my satisfaction, my pleasure was in working hard and helping other people. And now I'm beholden to all these people for just doing the basic things. I, I don't know how to ask people to help. No, no, George, I, I think, you know, I think the last thing you're saying, you're talking about would be a really good agenda for you because I think it's really important uh, for you now to be able to do something about asking for help, uh, allowing others to get the pleasure out of helping you. So what I'd like to suggest for you today, I wonder if you could take a couple of minutes today sort of working on kind of expressing your feelings. Uh, would you take a couple of minutes later on in the group when, we, when the time comes and, and try telling us precisely how lousy you feel so you could talk really honestly about how bad you feel? Would you be willing to do that? Yeah. I, I'm not sure I even have the capacity to do that. Okay. Well, perhaps but we can uh, give you some feedback as you're doing that so we can let you know whether or not we really can appreciate how lousy you feel. Okay. Okay, okay great. Mark, what could we do for you in this group today? Well, I suppose my agenda would be that I need to learn how to express rage. How so? Well, my doctor said that if I learned how to better express my rage, then I wouldn't do so much cutting on myself. It says that I turn it inside, and he said that's why I cut myself. So you want to learn how to express your rage more openly then, rather than expressing it by turning it on yourself. Yeah. You know, one of the things about expressing anger is for a lot of people, Meryl, are you, Meryl, are you with us? One of the things about expressing anger for a lot of people that makes it so hard is that a lot of us sort of let it build up and build up and build up. We don't see anything until then it kind of gets over the top. It's like a volcano exploding. At that point, it's really scary. It's scary for you. It's scary for other people. So I think maybe the way we could work on that in this group is for you to express it before it starts to build up a whole lot. In other words, see if you could express young anger, you know, young anger, just as it's beginning. Maybe you wouldn't even call it anger then. Maybe you call it like irritation or frustration, something like that. So what I want to suggest is if you'd be willing, you know, we could call on you at some points in the group. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe Mabel could call on you and see if you could get in touch then with whether you're feeling even the slightest bit of irritation or impatience. For example, whether you might be feeling a little uh, impatient with the way I'm leading this group, something like that. Would, would you be willing to do that? Well, can we check in with you later on today, a couple times? Yeah, I think that would be okay. Okay, good. I think that would be a good agenda for you. Meryl, what can we do in this group today for you? Oh, I don't like groups. I, I don't feel comfortable in this group. Um, I, I keep tuning in and out and in and out and I I hear about all these people's pain. They're they're all they're all so sad. I hear about a a sick a sick hand and a sick leg and a angry boy and I hear little parts of it and then I just tune out and, and, and I it's like leaving my body. I'm not like really here and I don't know why that is. I don't know why that happens to me all the time. Maybe what we ought to try working on in this group today is to sort of help you focus. Because sometimes you may kind of get overwhelmed with feelings and then you can't focus anymore. It's too painful to stay there. Would you, how about working on that with us today? When I was a little girl, when I was a little girl, 
My grandfather molested me. My therapist said that I should talk to you guys about that to the group. But why should I tell you guys that? Why should I tell you that? I mean, then you think I'm disgusting? Well, would you... It's not funny! Well, h hold on, Meryl. Would you want to take a look at how people feel towards you if you were to tell us something about some of the things that happened to you? You want to get some feedback from others as to whether or not people would really feel that you were disgusting or have bad feelings? Is that something you could take a look at? I don't know if it was me or my, my, my therapist that really wanted to know that. Maybe it was my therapist. Yeah. yeah. Mara, let, let me go back to the first thing you said. I have, I have a sense that maybe the most useful thing that you could work on in this group is staying focused. And I wonder if you would be willing to take a look at that today. I think if we could help you stay focused, you could do a lot more work in this group. Meryl, my, my impression, my experience, is that the reason that a lot of people I've worked with can't stay focused is they get upset, they get anxious about something that's happening. And it's hard for them to stay with the anxiety. It's too painful, so they start to skitter off into other parts. So I want to suggest that if we could check in with you and you could let us know as soon as you're starting to tune out. We could check in with you, and then you could begin to help kind of track down exactly the moment you started to tune out. And we could try and find out what was upsetting you at those points. That's not going to be easy for you. Would you be willing to let us know when you're starting to tune out, or if somebody sees you tuning out, they could kind of call on you, and we could take a look at when you started to tune out, what happened? Would that be something you'd be willing to try? So that means you're letting us know when you feel you're tuning out if you possibly can. Are others sort of taking... But we see it happen. If you see it happen, sort of call on her. And Mabel, don't forget, we're, I'm really counting on you to do a lot of that. This round of agendas that's been formulated by the seven members of the group is, uh, is not, a, not an atypical set of agendas. Uh, we sort of look at what they are. They're uh, agendas in which people are going to try to uh, learn how to help themselves feel better, learn how to make contact with others, learn how to uh, focus on what's happening in the group, learn how to express uh, anger or impatience in the group, learn how to, to ask for help. Uh, all these things, uh, and also get some feedback about their behavior. This is a fairly common uh, set of, uh, of agendas, and I think they're, they're a workable set of agendas. They, they provide us with the opportunity to really do some fairly focused uh, work in the remainder of this group. Let me say just a, a few things about the uh, agenda task in general and, and uh, why I think it's useful. First of all, I think as you're already beginning perhaps to see, it helps patients assume some responsibility uh, for their work and for their therapy rather than the possibility of having them being dependent or infantilized. Um, one thing I think that you may be beginning to see is that I think it's very important uh, not only the therapist be rather structured in inpatient group therapy work, but also that the therapist be active I think there's no place really for a uh, silent or passive or non-directive therapist in, in inpatient work. But we, we know from research uh, that there's a certain penalty that you pay if you're an extremely active therapist, which is the patients tend to become infantilized. Uh, they begin to expect all energy, all wisdom to come from the therapist rather from the patient. And I, I designed this particular task, the agenda task, as a way of, of uh, tending to offset that problem. Although the therapist is very active and very structured, nonetheless, he's active in a way that encourages patients to take responsibility for some aspect of their therapy. Now, keep in mind, as you've noticed, that the uh, agenda formation is a fairly complex task for patients. In a sense, what I'm asking each of them to do is a is a three step part is a three part step. First of all, I'm asking them to select some area about themselves 
that they'd like to change, uh, something about themselves that they feel they want to learn more about or want to change. That's the first step. And second step is they've got to select some area about themselves that has some type of interpersonal connotation. It's got something to do with what they want to change about the way they relate to other people. And then there's even a third step. The third step being that to make that kind of change, to take a look at that interpersonal issue in the context of the here and now of the group. Notice in the uh, agenda go round that the therapist had to provide that third step for every single patient in the group. Oh, for example, Rose. Without a great deal of difficulty, uh, Rose could say, yes, well, I am lonely. I have some real problem with isolation in my life. In a sense, Rose fairly quickly really accomplished the first two steps. She'd say, this is something about myself I want to change. It's something to do with my relationships with other people. But it's almost invariably the therapist that has to make that jump into the third step that that it she's going to begin to look at how she makes herself lonely right here in this group with with these particular people. Note too that I'm striving to make the agendas as specific as possible. If you have a patient in the group saying that they'd like to work on their self-esteem or work on their mood disorder, I mean the chances are are not very good this patient's going to get much help out of that meeting. But if you've got a patient, let's say like Sonia, who wants to work with her relationship with Marge and to be able to get some help from Marge, the chances of these two people doing some work is extremely good. So the more specific the agenda, the more likely it is that it will be filled. Note, too, that the agenda of Marge was originally that she wants to learn to express her rage. And that's something that uh, we do not want to happen in an inpatient group. And that's another uh, cardinal feature of inpatient group technique, is that you want to have as little con conflict as possible and as much support. Support, 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 much more than in an outpatient setting. Remember that one of the major goals of this group is that patients will find this process to be a constructive, supportive one, which they will want to pursue when they leave the group. So therefore, I tend always to try to make the group as supportive as possible. Maybe some patients might need confrontation or might need some type of conflict, but I'd much rather uh, lose those patients than engage in some type of confrontation which will make the group unsafe for the, for the greater number of patients in the group. I think I'd like to say just a, a couple words about this whole process of how you can design a group to meet your, your own clinical setting. Because the clinical settings are so varied, I can't possibly deal with, with each of these in any systematic way. I think the first step that one has to, to take in this process is to, is to make a careful assessment of what the clinical facts of life are on the ward. Because there may be some facts of life that are absolutely immutable. You can't change them. Let's say the, the length of hospitalization, or let's say the heterogeneity of population. There may be some other facts of life that are in fact not immutable at all and can be changed with, with the group therapist's influence uh, with, with the administration. For example, some wards say have a tradition of a group meeting only once or twice a week. Um, and, and, and that's something that the group therapist should put his or her effort behind because I think a group to be effective on an inpatient setting should meet frequently. Well, once that's done, once you assess what the clinical conditions are under which you have to work and then think about how to design a group, I think the next step is to, is to begin to formulate a series of goals that are realistic for that group, that time setting with these type of patients. Uh, and you need to be careful that the group goals are realistic. If they're not, if you have a set of unrealistic goals that are too ambitious for this therapy group in, in this setting, then I think what will happen is that one ends up being either a therapeutic nihilist or one begins to feel that uh, he or she is not a group, group therapist or that group therapy is not a, a useful modality. So let's sort of think about what goals might be possible that, that the group can, can do and can achieve in that time. I think goals, for example, of breaking down isolation are doable in a therapy group. 
not only does that help patients uh, begin to have some tools at their uh, disposal to use uh, when they leave the hospital and be able to make more contacts, but also it can help them while they're in the hospital begin to interact with others and use the hospital program more effectively. I think a, a, another part of contemporary hospitalization is that it's very important that patients be involved in some type of aftercare. The contemporary pattern of brief but repeated hospitalizations only really works if there is good aftercare in which patients participate. And aftercare is very often delivered and effectively delivered in groups. So if we can get patients involved in a therapy group in the ward, a group that they consider constructive, rewarding, and will want to continue this modality when, we, when they leave the hospital, then I think it'll be a process very, uh, very worthwhile. Other types of goals are for patients who've never been in therapy before to I simply heard. learn that talking helps back. to spot problems that they can work on I work other back times back. in their therapy or perhaps the, to begin to get the idea that they can be useful to others. That's always an important function of groups. Patients come into the hospital usually quite demoralized, and it's often a, a blessed relief for them to find out that, that they have something to offer to others that, that, will be, that will be useful. Now I'd like to turn to the next tape, and we're going to then begin to look at how do we fill these agendas in the given amount of time possible. Or I should say, how do we fill as many agendas as possible? Remember what we're trying to do in this group is to be efficient. We can't assume that there's going to be work that's, be, that's going to be done tomorrow. One of the major changes that one has to make in one's group therapy technique has got to do with the, the temporal span of the group, temporal frame of reference, outpatient group, my frame of reference is that this group will meet for weeks, for months, and I'll work through certain themes over and over again. But an inpatient group with a composition changing almost daily, I think that the life of the group should, uh, should be one meeting, one hour, one hour and 15 minutes. Maybe patients will be back tomorrow. Maybe there'll be some culture barriers, but don't count on it. I've, I've led a inpatient therapy group daily for five years on an inpatient ward. Uh, and I rarely had the identical group meeting two straight days, and almost never had the identical group meeting three straight days. So I think of the group as being uh, the greatest good for the greatest number in the single group therapy session.